All right, so those of you who know me uh, probably expect me to tell a joke about right now. Um, and I, I won't disappoint you. Um, <laughs> and for those of you who don't know me, uh, you can expect a joke uh, about right now. I, I try to start my seminars off and, and um, keep them a, a little bit humorous. I, I think uh, humor is, is, is really, really important. Okay, so here's the joke. So um, a, a young undergraduate or had just gotten a, or graduate had just gotten their master's degree and in the U.S. and they decided that they were going to go out west and make their way in the world and they decided that they were going to get into this business of sheep farming. So you know, being a good on the ground person, he noticed that there was a fellow up in the hills uh, grazing sheep, and so he drove his truck up to him and he said. Uh, I want to get in this business, but I don't have any resources. I owe lots of money to the federal government for uh, student loans, and so I want to try to pay those back. Um, so what I would like to do is to make you a wager. And I would like, um, in return, if I win the wager, to get one of your animals, right? And that way I can get going and get some capital in this business without having any resources of my own. So the old sheep farmer says, okay, I'll take you up on that, that bet. and." Um, he goes on and he says, okay, so what's the bet? And the young man says, well, you know, with all of my uh, schooling and education, I can tell you exactly how many animals you have in your flock. And the farmer says, we're on. The bet is on. So the old guy goes over there, goes over, takes out his computer, does a quick survey scan, does a model run and calculations and stuff. You have 432 animals in your flock. I says, that's absolutely spot on. You win. Go ahead, take your pick. So he goes over there and he picks up a critter and puts it over his shoulders and starts walking back to his bus. And the old farmer says, now I'd like to make you a, a bet. And he says, um, okay, what's the bet? He says, I bet I can tell you what degree you have. And if I win, I get to take my animal back. He said, okay, you're on. He says, you, sir, are a certified wildlife biologist. He says, how could you tell that? He said, you just picked up my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the reason I, I, I tell that story and the joke, um, it, it's wonderful. Um, most of my Swedish friends, um, are uh, they use the word story as synonymous with my joke, so I, I, I like that a lot. The reason I tell that is that um, that's one of the themes of, of my talk today. And, and, and it's one of the frustrations that I have of three decades of being a scientist and trying to solve real world problems with tools, techniques, approaches and stuff that I learned in academia and learned after that in, in, in professional world and even in reading the academic literature. But the frustration comes in with the same kind of paradox that emerged in that joke. And that is, why are we not making any more progress in solving complex environmental issues at many scales, given the, the really amazing array of tools and training that we have? So in some ways, that joke was kind of um, a, a sort of lead in to my presentation. Okay, so I, I picked a, a broad enough and bland enough title here that I can basically talk about any, anything. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit today about some of the, the big, broad challenges I think we face as scientists, academics, and, and in, in the world today. I don't think there's any doubt or any uh, large argument that the scales of our problems are increasing, uh, both in terms of spatial temporal scales of those problems. Um, we've now entered the new geologic era, the Anthropocene. And, and also that the world is becoming more complex. Right? Um, I, I think one uh, probably not too far interpretation of recent U.S. elections was how uh, different coping strategies for dealing with an increasingly complicated world. And on one side, it was reliance on very simplistic solutions, right? One size fits all kinds of solutions versus, no, we have to do something different. We have to do, try some other things. And moreover, all of this is embedded in this idea of um, 
consequences, right? That things that we try to do, the cost of those uh, actions and consequences are becoming more severe and more costly. So how does one operate in a world like that? I say one argument is to retreat to simplicity, right? An oversimplicity, a retreat to sort of faith-based um, initiatives that um, um, people say, well, we need to try this, right? Based upon a severe passion or, or, or intuition, right? Which really excludes what most of us in this room are about, the, the huge amount of technical and scientific understanding that can be brought to bear in these kinds of solutions. Um, I guess to sort of cut to the chase and get to the end, it's neither of those, but it involves both of those in terms of what I think are, are ways forward. So in terms of dealing with um, things like global climate change, right, there are sort of three basic strategies. One is to ignore that it's going on or deny that it's going on. Um, this is actually a, a real quote from um, um, a U.S. politician not too, uh, lives not too f down the road from me, um, more closer to Lisa's home territory than mine. Um, that climate change, and of course he throws in evolution and all these other things that are nothing but a hoax that has been perpetuated by the scientific community. So crazy craziness in the, in the U.S., right? Um, um, but, but I think that, that part of that is, is this dealing with this complex world that we live in, right? Is this rejection of sort of rational and scientific approaches um, as a compensation for dealing with this overwhelming complexity. Um, uh, um, going, getting past that, and, and of course we all know that, that certainly ignoring and denying and fighting these scientific claims is, is part and parcel to the world uh, when new ideas are introduced. But moving past that, uh, right, sort of one other approach to deal with things like climate change is to mitigate the factors that are driving it. And so lots and lots of ideas about how to reduce emissions, how to, how to change land use, how to manage carbon in different and unique ways. And then the sort of third thrust is how do we adapt to these new worlds? And that's sort of what I'm going to uh, be talking a lot about today is this world of, of adaptation. What do we mean by adaptation? Um, as another little bit of, of revealing my assumptions before I get started uh, talking about this, um, based upon uh, hanging around really, really neat people like the Resilience Center has lots and lots of really neat, smart people, you know, I, I've learned a lot. And, and uh, one of my good colleagues in all of this, uh, Francis Wesley, um, uh, educated me on this sort of problem matching problem. That is, how in, in life we're faced with qualitatively different types of problems that, we're, that we have to solve. And that sometimes it's useful to think about those different types of problems and the kinds of solutions that are generated by those different sorts of frameworks or assumptions going into explaining those. Right? And in a, in a good kind of hauling rule of thumb, you know, there's always three of everything. Um, so I, I made up sort of three classes of problems and solutions here. One are, are, are which people want to retreat to, right? Sort of simple linear, linearizations of, of these complex problems in which there are very few variables involved, mostly linear sets of relationships uh, amongst those variables. The world is predictable from those kinds of, of relationships, right? We, we know what's going to happen before it happens. Um, and it would be nice if, if the world uh, operated that in, in terms of that kind of, of, of mental model, right? And uh, for those of you who know a lot more about cognitive psychology than I do, um, you know, from what little I've read, that's sort of the way our brains are wired as human beings, right? We're cognitively limited in terms of the numbers of variables that we can deal with at any given time. Uh, we tend to be very linear in our way of, of interacting with the world um, and, and uh, how we've set it up. So this is kind of a default position, if you will. Of course, um, all of that, all of those questions that go into that approach are really um, the, the offspring of now almost four decades of this idea of resilience being in, in our world, right? 
the big, and, and again, I'm probably, as we say, preaching to the choir here, right? But the introduction of these resilience frameworks are, are sort of anti-linear in their, in, their, in their positing, right? That the world exists as a result of cross-scale and non-linear interactions. <coughs> there are these things called alternative states or regimes, each of which exhibit dynamics over time of stability and uh, revolution. But then um, we argue that there's another class of problems. Um, there was a wonderful book by Kai Erickson 10, 15 years ago uh, called A New Species of Trouble about how new kinds of issues arise. And certainly, you know, 20 years ago, climate change, although some, I'm sure his picture is on the wall here somewhere, fellow associated with the university across the street said, well, you know, that's, this is pretty predictable what's happening with climate change. But in terms of um, the impacts of that uh, in, in new systems, configurations, the kind of transform transformative or transformational kinds of changes that exist in these systems, for which in many cases we have little or no experience of what these things might look like. Um, other uh, planners talk about them as wicked problems, right? In which not only are there no analytic solutions to these sorts of things, it's even difficult to define what these problems are. So I'm going to kind of roughly uh, base the rest of my remarks this afternoon on those three kinds of groupings. Um, sort of linear approaches to dealing with issues of climate change, uh, resilience approaches, and I'm going to not talk so much about climate change, but my experiences with using these sort of what I think resilience-based approaches uh, called adaptive management uh, and adaptive governance. What lessons do we have from those in terms of their efficacy or applicability to deal with these more pressing complex problems? And then I'm going to end up with um, I, what I think is, is more the kind of world that many of the people who I know in this room are, are working with. Um, I, I think that, that uh, what you folks are about are trying to figure out new ways of conceptualizing and managing and grappling with these problems in a um, sort of anti-theoretical way, right? And by anti-theory, I mean proto or pre-theory, for which you may not have good theory to explain or guide or understand. So for all you graduate students, it seems like this is really, really difficult in, in, in wading through this. I think it's because the level of this sort of new world that you're operating in is what you're um, up against. The other thing that I want to sort of emphasize here are, um, I, I think that in terms of these novel kinds of approaches, I'll talk a little bit about how um, the role of imagination uh, should be in these sorts of things, looking at new novel ways of creating composite stories about how the world might unfold, uh, rather than relying on a strictly scientific predictability or forecasting of how the world might be. Um, and then the bottom line, the sort of take home message is that whatever those stories are, whatever those lies are that we think are going to happen in the future, the only way we're ever going to know is to test them. Right? So in a time like this, I argue along with, and it's really not my idea, it's Buzz Hollings' idea, that the most important thing we can do now is to try some things. Try some experiments. Let's see, let's learn our way into the future rather than plan our way into the future. All right, so that's, that's sort of my spiel. You can go to sleep now and <laughs> do this. All right, so I, I, only in the last couple of years have I sort of gotten involved in, in looking at um, this approach of how the climate is already changing um, on our planet and how scientists are attempting to understand and, and, and forecast what those sorts of things. And so one of the biggest pieces of literature to hit in the last 10 years has been this idea about, well, that even um, simple things, although they're really not that simple, but things like hydrologic variables are not stationary anymore, right? That means that there are new levels of nonlinearities that have been 
observed already in these data sets, right? And a kind of simplistic way of thinking about that is you take a complex time series, like this is a set of rainfall data from the Everglades in South Florida, and you fit a line to it, right? And you say, is that line going up? Is that line going down, right? This is the kind of simplistic linearization that a lot of people are doing, right? Whether it's temperature data, you know, well, if we know which direction temperature is going, we can tell how, how quickly um, these species, like oak trees or chestnut trees are going to migrate, or pine trees are going to migrate somewhere, right? Or, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're useful, but they're um, very, very partial, you know, planning exercises that involve this sort of slow creep of sea level as it's coming up and inundating, right? Without any acknowledgement of these alternative ecological processes that counteract that, right? Sea level's been rising for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. So I'm going to kind of leave this here uh, because there's, a, there's enough uh, literature that I don't need to belabor it or something you know, and um, um, move on to uh, something uh, much more closer to um, what every, most folks in this room probably work on. Right? So as I said earlier, um, at its core, this idea of resilience, right, introduced almost 40 years ago now, makes us think dynamically, right? And it makes, I think, a sort of framework that allows for people to think about change in different ways. And moreover, that change is not simple and it's likely not predictable in terms of the kinds of changes that Halling originally posited in the 1973 article, right? Of these dramatic shifts in regimes, he was talking about ecosystems in which the sort of structure and process interact to form qualitatively and quantitatively different configurations, each of which could be stable over time. But it took almost 30 years for ecologists to prove that idea, right? To test that idea through lots and lots of observations, lots and lots of frustrations on how existing successional theory or trophic theory were not fitting their, their understanding of these complex system dynamics over time, right? And all of that was sort of summarized almost 10 years ago now, but you all work with this growing list of, of ecological systems that, that have been changed that way. Right. Now I argue, although there are lots and lots of reasons for it, but that the, the sort of um, tools of the trade, if you will, that emerged from this presumption that ecological systems operated more like uh, resilience theory would predict um, are these adaptive approaches, whether it's adaptive assessment, adaptive management, and adaptive <coughs> governance. Right. So 35 years ago, people like Carl Walters and Ray Hilborn, who won the Volvo Prize about six, four years ago for their development of this approach called adaptive management, right? And it, it says right up front, the best action can't be determined. It's not an analytical uh, um, solution to the problem. But instead, it has to be tried, attempted, and see what works, right? Now, part of that is because of um, the complexity, the sort of numeric complexity of these systems, these kinds of nonlinear relationships. And yet a lot of our policies still presume that kind of linearity in relationships. Right? So we have a pollution problem or algae bloom. Well, we got to pull back on that linear lever of reducing inputs into the lake, right? Whether they're ph phosphorus or nitrogen or, or something like that. So it, it, it introduces a much more complicated kind of analysis and a, a complicated kind of, of, of policy, right? One of the other links to this idea of resilience theory is that it's a recognition um, up front that resource managers are really about trying to solve regime problems. Right? 
in that conservation strategy, so like the, the Grand Canyon Colorado River here that I'm talking about where uh, a dam was built in the early 60, 60s and induced an almost automatic physical regime shift. Right? It wasn't one of these slow things that, that revealed itself over time, like coral reefs or something, but it was pretty, pretty hard and fast, right? So what happened? Well, it flipped this river from being one that was muddy and clear, cold and hot, to a pretty cold, clear river now, right? So here was an automatic regime shift. There were other species introduced, so there's a new configuration of species, and who eats whom and the trophic relationships and all those sorts of things. So a lot of the restoration efforts, the management efforts that have evolved over the last 20, 25 years are about testing ideas about how much of that original regime could be restored. Right? Through creative flow releases, through creative manipulations, uh, control of certain populations, and I'll go into some of the details of that in a minute. But the point here is that managers have one of two problems, right? You're either trying to get the system back into some state that people say they want because it's better or worse or negotiated on, or you try and protect it from going into a place that you don't, it doesn't want to go, or you don't want it to go, but you know that that exists, right? So you're trying to keep it from flipping into some um, alternative undesirable regime. Uh, an example I use for that is uh, nutrient inputs off of agricultural fields into the freshwater Everglades. There's an incredibly low threshold, something on the order of 10 to 15 parts per billion phosphorus, that once it accumulates in the soil, it flips the system away from the native vegetation, native fauna, into this um, um, sort of monotypic stand of, of cattails, right? Of course, wetland ecologists know that all over. But it's the same sort of thing. And, and 20 years ago, there were huge lawsuits, lots and lots of research that went on trying to understand where that tipping point was, right? Where is that threshold for that regime shift? And it turns out that it's just barely above detectable limits. Okay. So this idea of if the world is operating like this, and it's difficult to predict, or impossible, I guess, in, in, in an extreme case, to predict how one moves among these alternative regimes, then the best you can do is to set up these policies as hypotheses to test these ideas. So there's a whole process of trying to evaluate, come up with competing claims about what led to these resource changes, um, how would you set up some experiment to test it, right, to restore some of these um, um, lost values? Um, at, at, the, at the root of these kinds of uh, adaptive management approaches is this notion that most um, policies are really questions disguised as answers, right? It's what we think are going to happen in these systems. And therefore, it's just as important to test those ideas as it is to figure out which one is correct before we can act on one. Um, just a little bit of review, because um, I've been involved in this for almost 30 years of my life now, um, applying these, these ideas of adaptive management uh, to this complex resource system of, of the Everglades in South Florida. Lots and lots of endangered species, uh, sort of competing claims about what led to their endangerment, uh, competing claims about what sorts of uh, management actions are required to remove them from an endangered status, um, lots of issues about water trade-offs, water supply. Um, there are now seven or eight million people, if I can get this to work, um, who are competing with these wading birds for water resources from the Everglades. Um, there are the nutrient problems I just told you about. Uh, and sets and sets of, I don't have a picture for it here, invasive species, right? New species that are colonizing all the time. Um, the most recent one are big snakes. These pythons that were released into the Everglades about 15 years ago are now become naturalized and established. So the point here is that 
And, and, and the reason I keep bringing up the Everglades is that it's characteristic in that there's not just a one environmental problem, but there's this whole suite of complicated environmental problems that have to be tackled at the same time. And yet our, our, our sort of management approaches, and certainly the tradition that I was brought up in, is that, well, we have water quality specialists and they will solve water quality problems, right? We have invasive species specialists, on and on and on. And what's missing are these kinds of integrative um, approaches. Um, some of the lessons of using these adaptive approaches uh, that uh, 20 some years ago we completed a, an environmental assessment of that uh, project and we actually were able to develop these kinds of integrated and composite solutions. What I mean by that is that you have to consider water quality, water quantity, um, um, species requirements, invasive requirements, all of those things together that isolating them and trying to deal strictly with one or the other is pathologic and it's not getting anywhere. Um, one of the other things that's important in this adaptive management approach is to understand in this resilience terms the hypotheticality of alternative regimes. <coughs> That is, if, if the game is to try and restore a system to an alternative configuration, does that exist? Can you get there? We know that extinction is a stable state, but it's not an acceptable stable state. Right? We know that it's there. So it's really important in these assessments to understand these hypotheticalities of alternative configurations and moreover what are the sets of experiments that we need to try to figure out how we cross these thresholds. Can we get these systems back in some state? And it's not just one thing, it's a set of actions that are gone together. And I think that that's congruent with a lot of the other literature uh, Martin Sheffer writes about in terms of flipping lakes back and forth. It's not just manipulating one variable, water quantity or water quality, right? It's a combination of those actions that involve trophic manipulations, that involve nutrient manipulations, all at the same time under um, certain conditions that can enable these kinds of forced flips in the system. Right. All right, so what happened? Um, all of these assessments that were done in the early 90s, uh, built an integrative understanding, uh, led to a large federal uh, commitment of, of money on the order of $8 billion of uh, making the wet field of dreams. Right? That is, of restoring the hydrology in this vast wetland such that um, the endangered populations will return, they will be healthy again. And uh, I, I and, uh, call it an $8 billion bet. That's exactly what it is. They're betting that they can do this uh, and fix it. Um, what have we learned in the 12 years or so since this $8 billion bet was made? Um, there really hasn't been any progress, right? There, every time people try to put together an experiment to test these ideas, it gets shot down. Legally, socially, fiscally, we can't do that. We can't experiment. We can't, do, we can't manipulate that part of the system. Um, it's not due to a kind of institutional complexity, that is the number of stakeholders or agencies that are involved in this, but I think it, it really has to do with this, um, this problem of the Everglades, much like I think the US politics, are in a real trap. And one of the sort of symptoms of the systems being in this trap, which is very stable, right? very rigid, it doesn't change, is this inability to experiment. right? that any sort of new ideas, novelty that gets introduced in these systems gets slowly argued about or squashed. Right? You can't bring up ideas um, that are um, um, difficult to deal with. 
And so, and I'll talk a little bit about it later on, that, um, but these traps require um, large influxes of external resources. So in the kind of panarchy model, and I apologize for not spending a lot of time going over it, but that these traps are sustained by lots and lots of resource inputs. That's how they stay there in addition to sort of stifling um, the innovation that goes on. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, um, 10 minutes or so, okay. Talk a little bit more about um, uh, where I think a more successful understand, set of understandings have gone on and management actions have gone on associated with the Glen Canyon Dam in the Colorado River. Again, complex set of resource issues, um, <coughs> I'm going to kind of pass over that, but what they have that the Everglades don't have is adaptive governance, right? They have this sort of quasi-governmental uh, group that's comprised of stakeholders, uh, formal agents, uh, informal groups, all of whom get together and they decide on one thing. They decide on sets of experiments to do. That is, let's try these things and see what works. So since 1996, when this group was formed, there's been a series of at least three large um, experiments. Uh, in this case, it's releases of water from the dam under certain conditions uh, to flood habitat, to primarily move sand that's in the water up on the sides and deposited it in, in terms of beaches. Uh, and, and lots of arm waving about the effects of such releases on um, biology. Now the people that manage the dam can tell you exactly how much it costs to experiment, how much uh, sort of what is it, opportunity cost is lost by releasing the water out the tubes rather than running it through the turbines and making electricity. But they're willing to do it. Right? They're willing to do these experiments to meet these multiple sets of, of objectives. Uh, and then since 2002, for about 10 years now, there have been a whole series of, of experiments on controlling predators. Um, again, invasive or uh, an introduced species um, uh, for a sport fishery that it, um, seems to be preying on uh, one of the endangered species. In this case, it's the humpback chub. So what have we learned from these sets of experiments? Um, that it's really the way to go, I think. Um, that it really was critical. It changed their understanding, their scientific models about how sediment moves, how water moves in this system. And they would not have discovered that unless they had done these experiments. Um, the other, I think, component of this which is missing in the Everglades is this role of multiple embedded leadership. Right? It's not one person at the top dictating what goes on. <coughs> but multiple, multiple leaders um, acting at different scales and different agencies, all of whom were willing to do these experiments and learn from these experiments, admit when they're wrong, and change and adapt. Okay, um, let me see how I'm doing here. All right, so to kind of sum up this approach to adaptive management, it's been applied in many, many ecosystems around the world, um, learning while doing, um, there are some successes, lots of constraints, but again, um, it, at the core of it is this notion of experimenting and testing and the role of um, adaptive governance in there. All right, I want to kind of move on to this um, third notion of, of new and um, sort of different uh, ways of thinking about um, the future. And again, this is nothing new to lots of folks in this room, uh, the development of scenarios. Right? Uh, I think that they are um, wonderfully insightful, uh, wonderfully imaginative in terms of thinking about how uh, things might unfold. Um, there are lots of constraints on them as well, but I, one of the things they do is they open up the conversation. And they open up and allow analysts to realize where obstacles occur and where there are opportunities. And many times both of those are embedded in a kind of complex discussion. 
a complex set of arguments that go on around these resource issues. I'm going to kind of briefly go through a couple of those that were developed for the Southern Everglades um, National Park. Um, again, it's probably nothing new here, but I'll quickly talk about them um, and uh, in, in the few minutes that I have here without going on too long. Um, one of the sort of robust predictions that I, I think about climate change is that um, things are going to get more variable. Right? Things are going to change, um, as one uh, climatologist described it, um, weather is going to behave as if it had taken steroids. Right? Colds are going to get colder, hot's going to get hotter. And yet most people that I talked to said, well, it's going to get warmer. Right? The earth is warming, right? So I, I, I like this idea about, well, what, what's going to happen, I think, is that um, there are going to be more surprising events, like, and I'll come back to that in a minute, like Hurricane Sandy that just happened a, a week or so ago. But if this were the case, one of the ideas in this scenario is that it will essentially cripple both the human system and the water system. That is, with these recurring storms, it's going to overwhelm the capacity of people living there to re rebuild their structures. People are going to leave, depopulate, abandon Florida. I can't afford to live there anymore. Um, back in the 1990s, insurance companies were pulling out of Florida because they saw their costs were exceeding their revenues. We can't make money doing that. So we're leaving. We're not going to insure certain structures. The state of Florida stepped in and became the insurance agent. And they said, well, we will back you up. But that doesn't mean that things like, so Hurricane Katrina caused a, a further depopulation of the city of New Orleans. There have been times in the history of South Florida where hurricanes caused um, a depopulation because people didn't want to deal with that anymore. And the, the, the sort of ultimate conclusion of this is that with these recurring storms, all of the kind of revenue and tax base that builds these big water management problems is going to collapse over time. And we've already seen parts of that. This big state management agency has collapsed over the last four years because of the collapse of the housing market the devaluation of revenue and so this thing that was once this huge half a billion dollar a year organization is now probably a fifth of that because of this um, changes um, due to storms. One of the other approaches in many water resource systems in the developed world is right is uh, what we call this turning the black gold into blue gold some sort of desalinization approaches to meet water supply demands, or the sort of technological optimist that we can deal with water resource problems um, through privatization, allocation, through markets, and all those sorts of things um, as, a, as a kind of future scenario. Um, another one is that it's going to get a lot drier, right? That in addition to these sort of recurring storms that might happen, um, there's going to have to be a whole other renegotiation in terms of the kind of laws that govern the allocation of water across the landscape. And politically, we know who's going to win those. It's going to be the urban areas. And then, of course, finally, there's always the requisite scenario, right, of the green one, uh, where, where things actually uh, meet the three bottom lines of sustainability, uh, restoration succeeds, uh, the sort of blue water, brown water, green water arguments have all been resolved in ways that, that are, are, are sustainable in long term. Right? But one of the things that sort of came out of these stories is again this need for experimenting. Right? And yet the history of the Everglades shows, as I said earlier, this notion that experimentation is really hard. And one of the reasons it's, it's, it's hard is that people um, get together, decide what to do, and then something's going to whack them upside the head. 
say, wait a minute, that's not working. Um, an another way of saying this is that if we look back at the recent history of water development in the Everglades region, it has been a climate-driven adaptation. Where variation in climate right, um, um, really has spawned these sort of spurts of dealing with how are we going to manage these flood issues? How are we going to manage these conservation issues? How are we going to manage these water quality issues? Have all been driven by these floods, droughts, eutrophication events. So it's this notion that variation that's going on at these larger scales really are the sort of um, test crucible for the next round of adaptation. Because what these big events do, right, these crises or surprises, is they put the existing sets of policies, technologies at risk. They say, were we able to withstand that? Is that something that we were able to cope with? Or do we need to adapt? Right? Do we need to transform? Do we need to change these sorts of things? So my bottom line is that um, I think the future is full of these kinds of events. And so there's lots and lots of opportunities to learn from these events. But I think that we have to get ready for that. Okay, so let me try to finish up here in the last few minutes. Um, so, so one of the things you have to do when, you, when you're a grandparent is, is put shameless pictures of, of your grandchildren in here. So here's my shameless plug of my grandson. <laughs> and it's just great because I think that's what we need to do. So, so what is he doing there? We have this wind chime hanging on our porch in our backyard. And he has got this long stick that he went out in the yard and found. And he's probing that wind chime. He's experimenting with it. Right? This is what we need to do, folks. We need to develop these kinds of alternative views, these alternative futures that involve composite problem, problems and integrated composite solutions. Recognize where there are opportunities for experimenting. And I think climate change is going to provide lots of those. How do we develop incentive systems so that people profit from change rather than profit from stability? And I think these sorts of things like are going on in the US of shrinking government budgets and all those sorts of things are actually opportunities for change. Um, I also think that um, it's a time for universities to step up and play new roles. Um, I, I can't tell you how, um, how wonderful a place those of you who are affiliated with the research, uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center is. Because that's really what this place is. It's this wonderful think tank that's testing, developing ideas, theories, those anti-theories for the future. That's really what builds this adaptive capacity, right? Is this engagement of lear a learning-based community that can help people learn as we adapt. Uh, one of the other things that um, we'll talk about here is how do we stimulate these experiments? How do we create incentives? I don't know, but I think that's really where we need to look. I think uh, groups like the SRC are, are really good at that. And then the other one is that, you know, the reason um, experimenters and laboratory scientists, academics can experiment is because they fail. That's how they learn, right? In a laboratory setting or a mesocosm setting, if you fail, they're not great costs. But if you remember way back to the beginning of my presentation, those costs are increasing. So we have to figure out ways to make policies and experiments that are safe to fail. Not just for the resources involved, but for the people. And with that, I'll, I'll end. So I think that it, it, uh, this uh, whole idea of building adaptive capacity is going to rely on not further disciplinary partitioning, but integrating science, management, and policy um, as we learn our way into the future. Uh, I think it calls for certain kinds of leadership 
a leadership that allows people to experiment and say, okay, it is safe to fail. And links, is, links across scale. And I'll leave you with this uh, painting from the late 19th century by Henri Rousseau. The title of it is Surprise. And with that, I've gone over just a little bit, but I'd be happy to stop and take any discussion or questions or anything you might have.